Welcome in everyone. We're going to get started shortly. As everyone is coming in, if you would like to put your name, organization, and title in the chat so we can know who's joining us today. All right, as you are, all are continuing to share your name, organization, and title in the chat, we're going to get started. Liz, you can go to the next slide, which is our agenda. Um, so we would just like to say welcome to you all. Thank you for attending today's webinar, which is sponsored by Apprenticeship PHL, the Keystone Development Partnership, and the Keystone Apprenticeship Alliance. Um, today, you will hear from employers, labor management leaders, and workforce development professionals around best practices in building sustainable apprenticeship programs within the medical and healthcare industries. We'll introduce our presenters in a moment, but we wanted to go over uh, a few of our Zoom webinar capabilities. Currently, the chat is enabled for all participants. Um, we will be disabling chat once our presenters begin. For questions, please enter your questions using the Q&A box. There will be a period of Q&A after each presenter, followed by a general Q&A session at the end of the webinar. We will enable chat at the end of the presentations for general Q&A and information sharing. Please feel free to use reactions throughout the time of the webinar. And now I will pass it to Tara Toms, who will introduce our presenters. Thanks everybody for being here today. Um, our current and future friends and colleagues in the apprenticeship space, we're so excited to have this event um, to, to welcome our presenters and uh, hopefully hear from their uh, lived experience, some best practices and um, anecdotes, uh, information about how to manage, uh, sustain, develop healthcare apprenticeships. Um, I just wanna welcome, I'll kind of read off this list of names before we get into the presentations. Um, Zach Zobris from SEIU Healthcare PA, who's gonna give us kind of a state of healthcare workforce summary at the top of this meeting. Um, after we hear from Zach, uh, we'll hear from Edgar Lagaspada and Kathleen Powell from Partners for Work. Um, they're doing great work out in Western PA with healthcare uh, apprenticeships and really building effective ecosystems uh, to support the work in this sector. So we'll hear a little bit about what they've been working on We'll pass it over after that to Terry Hinton from North Central Workforce Development Board and Latricia Cohen from Christ the King Manor um, to hear an example um, from the field on how a healthcare apprenticeship has really grown and shaped um, in that regional labor market, the, um, the healthcare landscape and opportunities for people who are entering the field. And then um, at the bottom of our session, uh, we'll, most, we'll very importantly hear an update from Jared Young, our representative from the PA Apprenticeship and Training Office who focuses on healthcare apprenticeship um, and we'll just get kind of a, a summary from him on, on what the priorities of the state agency look like and what we can expect to see going forward um, as we endeavor toward this work. Um, I recognize many of the people on this call today and I'm so happy that you're here. I hope that we're able to, to offer something to you that really um, illuminates a practitioner level uh, reality around how to build these programs um, and what makes them successful and, and hopefully inspires you in your own work going forward. Um, so again, thank you so much for being here. The Keystone Apprenticeship Alliance is really proud to partner with APHL on this. Um, and we'll kick it over to Zach Zobrist to start us off. Thanks, Tara. I'm excited to be here, happy to be here. Um, and uh, I'm my role in SAU Healthcare Pennsylvania is uh, Chief of Staff. I've been with SAU Healthcare Pennsylvania since 2002. Um, and uh, was asked to kind of share about the state of the healthcare workforce. And I'm gonna sprinkle in some ex experience or challenges around, um, you know, some of the work that we're trying to do and opportunities as well um, in workforce development and apprenticeship um, in our union. So you can go to the next slide because I want more important than myself is that uh, you can trust that I have a decent pulse on where the state of healthcare is by, um, being connected to 21,000 union members um, who are statewide all across Pennsylvania. Um, we have 110, about 110 nursing homes that we represent around the state that includes dietary housekeeping, CNAs, LPNs in many cases. Um, about 4,000 home care, direct care workers around the state, and then hospital workers that include dietary housekeeping tax and registered nurses. So it, it varies based on the hospital, um, but it it does mean that 
um, I think in our organization and in my role have a uh, pulse on kind of where the healthcare workforce stands. And the next slide, I think you, it's fair to summarize it as, oh, let me talk about our training fund and then I'll kind of give the key thing that I think about with healthcare workforce. But connected to our union is um, a training and education fund. Um, uh, picture on the top right are some um, graduates who did a micro-credential class around um, non-violent crisis um, training, uh, intervention training. Um, but our training fund does skills training, micro-credential training, uh, provides tuition reimbursement for thousands of nursing home and home care workers around the state uh, for over 70 different employers. Um, so part of that is upskilling and, and career development um, support work that they that um, our staff in our training fund do. Um, and then a separate kind of key piece of work that our training fund does is actually, you know, trains thousands of uh, home care, direct care workers. Um, and they just kind of really wrapped this up in the last year, but trained several thousand home care workers in various class safety classes and skills training classes um, in the participant directed home care workforce in Pennsylvania. Workers that used to just go into being a home care worker without any training now have the opportunity for um, lots of uh, paid um, training opportunities. Um, so that that uh, is part of my work. I stay connected to our training fund and, you know, means that I'm also have a some um you know sense of the the workforce and training challenges out there as well um but the key thing for me on the state of the healthcare workforce is the workforce crisis is still here um it i think is talked about less than it was um during the pandemic and right out of the pandemic but the effects of lots of um healthcare workers leaving during the pandemic still brings real challenges to the industry. So whether that was early retirement, um, we've had a lot of our nurse members just very challenging, you know, it, it pushed them to retire um, sooner than maybe they were planning. Uh, there's estimates between 10 to 30% of CNAs across the country leaving nursing homes. And we felt that in Pennsylvania for sure as well. So the, both the legacy of that and just, some of the ongoing challenges with the, the the hard work that happens in healthcare and where pay stands means that the, there is a crisis. Um, these are some headlines from different uh, yeah news stories that I keep track of along the way. Um, you know, the top one just notes that uh, uh, there will be a shortage, especially of low end. Uh, home care workers in coming years. That was one of their kind of four main findings. Um, these are from industry reports like Mercer's and, and Becker's and others. Um, I think the next headline is the one that stands out to me that for the first time in 17 years, um, uh, staffing and workforce is the top concern. Usually it's financial challenges, which came in at number two and I'll touch on, but um, you know, it's it's something like I haven't seen in my 22 years that that you know pretty much every place you go the top thing that everyone is struggling with is finding the healthcare workforce um, that they need in a range of positions. Um, so we can go to the next slide and yeah, just a few anecdotes. These are just in the last uh, week, um, week or two weeks, just to kind of you know, bring some examples of the kind of stuff that we're seeing regularly hearing about around the state. So a smaller um, community, uh, smaller hospital in Southwest PA, um, you know, they are out of central sterile tax. I just learned this the other day, uh, which caught my attention and wanted me to reach out to Edgar. It's outside of Allegheny County, Edgar, but uh, I may call you anyway, because um, uh, I think there's an apprenticeship opportunity here, um, but they have no central sterile tax, essentially, um, that they had one person left um, and that person didn't succeed in passing a required test that they needed to pass due to some continuing ed requirements in that role. And if you don't have central sterile tax, your OR is not going to be uh, running or certainly running in the way that it it should in the timely way that it should. So that's one example. 
um, in the nursing home space, like uh, part of our work in our union is trying to figure out how we bring to scale CNA training around the state. And as we've been doing some some thinking and prep work around that, like con confirm what we were feeling, which is more and more community colleges, Votex are getting out of CNA training. Um, and so it just in the last two weeks, these places said, yeah, we're we're going to keep doing LPN training, but we're done uh, planning to do CNA training, which is the backbone of the nursing home workforce are the, are both the CNAs and the LPNs for the, for the nursing workforce, but CNAs are the the bulk of the workforce there. Um, so that's, that's a concern um, and kind of a general trend that we're seeing. And then a uh, chief nurse officer at a major academical medical center, the a biggest issue for our RNs um, the, the RNs now have staffing challenges in most hospitals, but, you know, one of their top challenges is finding ancillary staff. Um, if the registered nurses don't have the support staff that they need that come in a lot of ways, they can't do their work. And this chief nurse officer said, I've never seen anything like this in her 30 years of uh, being a chief nurse officer in terms of trying to find ancillary staff. Um, so the crisis is still here. Um, I will um, have some data here to just show, uh, this is some data that we're looking at in kind of the statewide workforce healthcare subcommittee, workforce board development committee. And um, I took out a lot of jobs. I tried to get enough that fit on a slide. It's still a lot of data here, but the, the main point I tried to grab were some of the largest. Um, those are the ones that are highlighted, the largest um, kind of total volume of uh, workers um, in part to lift up that um, home health and home health aids, um, you know, is larger uh, than the, the RN workforce. Um, and especially when you continue to project out needs for 2030 and the entry wage, the entry wage for home health aids is 1142. I think the average wage is about $13 an hour. Um, and so that's, if we're just thinking about healthcare broadly, um, that's a real challenge when workers are, are, um, making, you know, 11, 12, 13 dollars an hour for nursing assistance below that. Um, entry wage here is showing us 1489. I think we've done a lot of bargaining in the last two years as as a union, and many of our CNAs are coming in now at um 17, 18 dollars an hour, some are at 19, some are at 20. Um, but even 17, 18, which is I would say more the standard that we're seeing, is it's it's not enough uh for the vital and backbreaking work that that uh CNAs do in in nursing homes and um and again you know tens of thousands of folks that we need to to train we're at a moment where we have new staffing um regulations we think for good reason so that so that residents can have the care that they need and and have the right um the, the CNA can have the time that they need to get to folks but it means we've got to be training more CNAs to help make all of that happen. So um, those are some themes that I wanted to have stand out. Um, but there are many other roles, tech roles and others that may not be quite as large in need. Um, and there's many others beyond this list that are here, um, some of which have better pay, some of which still don't have great pay, like med assistants, phlebotomists. Um, and I just think that's that's a challenge. So it's why as a union, um, you know, we're, we are focused on that. We've got to raise wages, um, for healthcare workers, um, given the work that they do. And honestly, just to be able to keep workforce dollars and focus on these vital roles, um, if other jobs and industries are paying more, it's understandable that workers are looking at other places and the challenges that often, you know, workforce dollars get deployed to other jobs that are paying better. So, um, this just summarizes some of those, um, challenges, uh, low pay for some jobs. And then 
you've got the high cost of schooling. Certainly RNs are, are feel that even though they're paid more, um, you know, they're challenged with pay in this current moment. And then, you know, they have very expensive schooling often required to be a BSN. But CNA programs are now running more than $2,000. Um, and so to go from someone looking for work into healthcare and have to pay that cost is a challenge. Um, and then you've got some jobs like the home care jobs where apprenticeship may not be easy because of the nature of the work. And it's it's just actually a very low currently uh, educational need, which maybe that's not the right bar, but that is the current the current standard. So lack of instructors, I think, is the other thing that I'm sure everybody's aware of. We want to get folks into apprentice programs. We want to get them into healthcare training, but trying to find instructors to do that is a real challenge. So um, the only thing that I wanted to, to say before I give a few examples, I didn't put a slide on this, but like what are strategies that employers are doing um, that we're seeing out there, certainly sign on bonuses, um, you know, looking at uh, immigration populations, you know, in, in the nursing home industry, there's looking at trying to, you know, how do we make jobs more accessible around, you know, the, just the basic requirements, um, some of which I think is good, some of which is good, but there's just going to be federal um, CMS or other challenges. That's that's a challenge in healthcare with the federal regulation. We may want to do creative things, but there's certain bars we need to meet. So, um, I think the big thing that's missing, um, which is probably not a surprise to everyone, is or the challenge is everyone wants the silver bullet. So we're trying to engage employers around kind of new solutions for workforce development. Um, but financial challenges remain in healthcare um, on the one hand. And so to try to make the case about long-term investment um, can be a challenge. Uh, employers want to see things at scale, big results. And we know that's not always how apprenticeship needs to start. So um, that's, that's, I think, an important um, lay of the land on the employer side as well, or some of the challenges that I face. The, the last challenge is Healthcare employers have gotten larger and larger, both in nursing homes as regional and out-of-state employers, and then in, in healthcare, more and more mergers. And so it just means to, to advance new ideas, trying to find the right folks in an organization um, are, is a challenge. Um, SEIU has done this in other states. It's what keeps me motivated here in Pennsylvania, you'll see I don't have a, coming with a, a, a list of successes and, and um we're going to leave that to to partner for work and others. Uh, in part, it's just been challenging. It's been challenging um, in Pennsylvania, but we're trying to learn from what SEIU is doing in other states as a union and and lean into this more as part of our union work beyond just raising pay and wages. So, in I put a list here: farm tax, behavioral health tax in Northwest. Um, in Washington, really, but they're now moving into Alaska and Oregon. Um, New York City and state have central sterile tech apprenticeships, nursing nursing home uh, LPN apprenticeships in upstate New York. California, SEIUHW has a range of apprenticeships and um, yeah, talk to folks regularly in Connecticut are doing CNA apprenticeship in nursing homes. You can go to the next slide. Uh, I think I'm at time. Um Here's just a photo of Central Sterile, which to me is a job that is a good opportunity um, uh, for apprenticeship. And again, the the challenge in healthcare, I think, is there are huge jobs where we need thousands and thousands of folks, and those get a lot of attention. And then there are there are less Central Sterile techs in a hospital, but every job in healthcare plays a pretty vital role. So um, again, Central Sterile, a smaller group, but one that I think is ripe for apprenticeship. As a union, we're trying to engage more in this space. And I just kind of my pitch to folks in the workforce world, uh, at least in SEU Healthcare PA, and I, I know 1199C and others are wanting to find ways to play a role. We know the workers, we know the employers, so we can try to navigate both sides. It's not easy, as I noted, as these employers get larger and larger. Um, you know, with a union involved, like, being able to ne negotiate pay and upgrades and those things is is doable and possible. Um, 
And and I just wanted to note one other model, I think, uh, that unions can directly contribute to like a C3 or a workforce intermediary um, and get employers to do that. And Futuro Health in California, I think, is an example where, you know, the union directly, um, Kaiser as an employer, have funded, um, you know, workforce development to get at scale, you know, and that and she's really trying to how do we get at scale because, we've got a crisis is the key um, takeaway for me as the state of healthcare that we're in. So I'll stop there. I th um, yeah. And see if there's questions, if that's the right next step, Tara. Thank you, Zach. I believe uh, we had a question in the chat. Um, I'll kick it over to Gloria. Yeah, there's uh, one question in the chat from Colleen. Have you seen any opportunity for Medicare and or Medicaid to increase reimbursements in order for medical facilities to increase wages? Yeah, that's part of the work that we do as a union. Um, and the opportunity for us is at the state level. Um, we are advocating currently um, for uh, some increases um, or talking to the industry um, industries about what the right rate increases are and how we direct that money in a way that actually transforms healthcare. But that that is key because and and something that makes I think healthcare unique is that it's the reimbursements from those sources really uh, impact their ability um, to raise wages. So. Yes, at the state level, especially for hospitals, a lot of that is determined by uh, Medicare, which is really done at the federal level, and it's just much harder. It's much harder there to have because you've got to get 50 states uh, rowing in the same direction. So, Those were all the questions we had in the Q&A at this time, but I know that we're going to have some time at the end as well for, for more questions in case they come up. Awesome. Thank you so much, Zach. Really appreciate you framing things out like that and give us that, giving us that vision of where the work is now and what you're hoping to do with the union. Um, we will transition over to our next presenters now. Again, you know, thanks, Zach, for for being here and um, hope you're able to stick around. We'll have some more Q and A time at the end. Um, Edgar and Kathleen from Partner for Work, we're excited to hear what you have to share with us about your healthcare apprenticeship work. Um, so we'll turn it over to you. Uh, thank you so much, Liz. If you can go to the next slide, we'll get started. And then the next one. We are from Partner for Work. Uh, my name is Kathleen Powell. I am a program manager for Adult Workforce Services at Partner for Work. So in that capacity, I mostly support our PA career link offices and employers in bringing together the resources of the public workforce system to make uh, pathways into family supporting income for our participants. Edgar. Thank you, Kathleen, and hello, everyone. I'm Edgar Largas Pada. I'm the Senior Director of Industry Strategy. So in my role partner for work, I oversee our business engagement in our sector partnerships. So I have the privilege of working with stakeholders in the industries, you know, from employers to industry associations to, you know, um, unions and other community stakeholders, and really uh, be able to identify what are the challenges and maybe opportunities within the, in the sector and help them bridge the gap of how they can work with the public welfare system to um, address those challenges and capitalize on those opportunities. Kathleen? Yeah. So again, at Partner for Work, we are the Workforce Development Board for Pittsburgh and Allegheny County. Um, just a quick overview about Workforce Development Boards. Um, we are a board that leads the public workforce development for a specific defined geographic area. For us, it is Allegheny County, and we work with uh, our connected boards to move the segment of our state board. We are what I like to call us as quasi-governmental intermediaries. So we are in this interesting spot where we are a nonprofit, but we work within government rules and aligned with government funding to funnel opportunities to the job seekers in Pittsburgh and Allegheny County. 
Um, you might also hear, hear of us as WIBs or workforce investment boards. Um, the main job and the reason why workforce development boards are exist in law is to support a network of PA career link offices in Pennsylvania or American job centers nationally. So this is a network of workforce programs and activities where someone who can walk into a one-stop center and have everything they need under one roof. So this can be career services, career advisement, resume assistance, connection to employers, but also training services. So this would be specialized occupational employer-based, um, let's go back, occupational training systems, employer-based training, or apprenticeships. Um, I will say in our area, apprenticeships were slightly underused, and so that is one of the goals that Edgar and I are working together to bring a greater number of apprenticeships to our job seekers in this area. Additionally, there is business services and connection directly to employers, as well as work-based training opportunities, and for both the employers as well as the job seekers. So it's all about connection, as well as plenty of labor market information. Uh, next slide. Edgar. Hey, Kathleen, um, I'm going to move through these uh, fairly quickly uh, so that we can uh, get to the heart of, of what you guys are here to to hear from us. Um, but just a quick overview, again, industry partnerships I mentioned before. What we're really looking to do is uh, bring to, bridge the gap between industry and the public workforce system so that both funding can be blended and, and really move um, the system forward so that we can achieve those that system change that will create opportunity pathways for for people to get the right the right training the right skills and connect to real job opportunities and quality jobs within their chosen sector in this case we're talking about healthcare um and i think you know that's where apprenticeships really play a, a key role in helping us bridge um that gap and and helping people get on a pathway into a career in healthcare. So we'll go to, um, we can actually probably skip the next two slides if let's if you, if you, and let's go into um, partner for work and apprenticeships in healthcare. So in, the, in this slide, you see the key components of apprenticeships and many of you already are familiar with them. But what I, I like to uh, point out here is that when you look at them um, and if you see from our perspective as a workforce board, um, they line really nicely with um, we, our WIOA policy and what workforce boards are intended to do. And if you look at the next slide, you will see the many different funding opportunities through WIOA, right? You have individual training accounts on the job training, income worker training, and all these sound really great. And they're all really great uh, mechanisms for funding training. Um, but when you put all these two things together, they don't fit very nicely. And that is a challenge that the workforce system faces is that um, apprenticeships and the traditional way that in which us as workforce boards have been operating and funding has not been in lockstep for, for many years. And um, so this has been a challenge, but a, a good one because it, it's kind of forced us to look um, Kind of beyond uh, how we typically have operated, how we typically have funded training, and looking at our own local policies, and so that's where a lot of the work that's being done, and particularly by Kathleen, in finding where we can innovate, how we can do things differently, and how we can advocate uh, so that workforce boards have more flexibility and the ability to really um, be a better partner when it comes to not only getting apprenticeships registered, but also launching apprenticeships and sustaining them for the long term. So if let's say, go, go into the next slide, this slide is, is one that I, I love to, uh, it, it really captures what we have, have to do at this point, right? We Our formula funds are our WIOA dollars, or WIOA, our traditional workforce dollars, and they come with limitations, right? And so we we have to be able to, to think about of uh, you see that jar like those are the big big uh, rocks in that jar and how do we then you know combine that with state and federal grants and uh, foundation money and maybe investments from the industry um 
to figure out how do we are able to cover the cost of apprenticeships. And so it, it is a very um, fun puzzle at times to, to try to figure that out. Um, I think, you know, the, the key takeaway is that it has not been a straightforward process, but it has been one that has been very um, illuminating when it comes to identifying blind spots and gaps and being able to innovate and being able to think about different ways in, in which to fund uh, training. So um, it's been a great learning experience and, and one that I hope uh, will lead to changes, not only um, you know, in our local policy, but also maybe the state level so that um, you know, apprenticeships uh, become more prominent and easier to work with for workforce boards across the, the, the Commonwealth. Um, and one last thing that I will uh, leave before turning it over to uh, Kathleen um, is that this work would not be able to be done without the support of the ATO, but also the funding that comes from the Department of Labor and Industry in the form of P8 smart grants, both for industry partnership grants and apprenticeship grants. So that has been definitely key in able to fill in those gaps that OEO dollars typically leave um, when it comes to apprenticeships. Liz? Oh, I forgot about this. Before turning over to Kathleen, I just wanted to give everyone uh, an overview of the the apprenticeship programs in healthcare that we are uh, working on. So we've registered a CNA program. We've also registered, a, you know, um, a dental assistant program. We are in uh, in the process actually of having other SNFs and long term care providers um, register their own CNA apprenticeships. But also looking at uh, starting the we already started the process of an LPN to RN. We wanted to start with LPN, but the interest kind of took us uh, from from the employer took us into the LPN to RN because they want to tap into that pipeline that they have of L LPNs. But we will come back to LPN, maybe a CNA to an LPN apprenticeship. Uh, we are in the process of surgical tech. Central Sterile, Zach, I heard you loud and clear. We will connect. Uh, we've talked about this in the past, so I'm excited to uh, to reconnect with you on this. Um, medical assistant, we've, we've done some job shadowing and some uh, on-the-job training for medical assistants, uh, but I think that it's, there's also an opportunity for an apprenticeship there. Uh, and we are also working on an EMT apprenticeship. We want to really create a multiple entry points for uh, individuals to go into healthcare uh, roles and then build lattices uh, with apprenticeships. Liz, Kathleen. Uh, yeah, so I'm here to talk a little bit about what we've learned and some of the best practices that we've implemented as we operationalize these programs. Um, I will say from a program side, I love the dreaming that Edgar and I get to do together and we get to go and Edgar gets to go and find us some funds, and then we need to fit square pegs into round holes and make this work in ways that are appropriate um, to our local policies as well as state and federal regulations. So when we start thinking about how we began a lot of this work specifically in healthcare, there is really a three stage process that we went through. We are currently between phase two and phase three right now. But this began with a work-based training model. So we started getting our employer partners and our PA career link offices and ourselves more comfortable uh, with some grant funded work-based training models. So this is what Edgar was talking about. We call it our medical assistant pipelines program I'm really proud of. Where we worked with two major employers, we worked um, to either bring people into the medical industry and do job shadowing through, through a medical assistance, or we were able to move people from non-medical, non-clinical roles to clinical roles within the healthcare, some of whom were incumbent workers. Um, we worked these through regular WIOA work-based training models. So one was a customized job training framework and the other was an incumbent worker um, agreement. And we were able to move just over for just around 40 people through this program um, wrapping up right now. Now, this was not an apprenticeship, but it was a really great lesson for us to learn. We were able to use some of those PA Smart Grant funds 
to learn some best practices about connections between PA career link offices and the employers, as well as building our own capacity to write agreements and work within this system. Uh, the second phase is what I would call like the how do I say this? Like the seed funding phase, where we were able to again pull into um, grant funds, PA Smart, et cetera, to seed apprenticeships and to use that to register and then get apprenticeships off and running within our county. Um, this had a whole other set of learnings that we worked with. This could be getting employer partners used to being sponsors and working with Rapids to um, connecting all of the pieces in a vast array of a complicated system. Um, and our third phase right now, we are trying to make these sustainable and moving these apprenticeships from something that is grant funded. And so there are a number of people who can move through these quickly, but there's no sustainability uh, to relying then on the WIOA framework and to use that um, individual training account dollars or the OJT training dollars to support apprenticeships long term. Um, what we have found is it's best, the first step and the small steps are really helpful and you can learn a lot from them and then use that to grow your experience outwards and get everybody comfortable. Um, you don't have to dive in the deep end. We also spend a lot of time, I'm sorry, Edgar, are you trying to jump in there? No, go ahead. Okay. We also spend a lot of time trying to maximize the resource of workforce boards throughout um, our area and sometimes uh, across Pennsylvania for broader coordination. Um, in our l current apprenticeship that we are working on, we had an employer partner. Again, we're Allegheny County down in the Southwest, uh, enrolled two participants in Lycoming County in, the cent in Central. Pennsylvania. So this meant me reaching out to my partners with Central Advanced PA, trying to make sure that they could get their PA career link offices to enroll these participants, maybe use their supportive service dollars as appropriate, but use our training dollars and have our offices put services on um, so that these people could be supportive. It would make no sense for us to enroll them in RPA career link offices when they would not be able to talk to each other uh, in a long-term way. But we wanted to make sure that they weren't excluded from this programming. So for us at the WIB level, we wanted to say cooperation and coordination is everything. This has actually led to some efforts in our area where we are bringing WIBs and PA career link offices in our surrounding counties together so that we can have a sustainable way of coordinating these resources so that we're not so geographically based when a lot of our employer partners are not. Um, our county has a lot of, our area has a lot of transit across county lines for employment and work. And so when we can coordinate at that WIB level and the PA career link office level, we can provide more services to our on amazing apprentices and people looking to get into these family supporting jobs. And um, thank you, Kathleen. And I think um, let's keep go back for the last couple uh, points there. Um, so um, what Kathleen just talked about is uh, a prime example of why this is important to have a consistent employer engagement over long periods of time. The working with the public workforce system is clunky. It's not easy. And not for employers, not for uh, training providers, not for other community stakeholders. So it, it really um, requires um, that constant like repetition so that we can understand each other. It also helps us figure out ways in which we need to be able to translate this uh, lingo that we live in as workforce professionals and bring it to a more business speak, a more, you know, um, terminology that makes more sense for training providers and other other um, actors in the space. So consistently engaging to do that. It also um, makes it uh, easier to um, build that that goodwill that when you know things are you, you come to a point where it's very bureaucratic uh, and it slows down and we don't move at the, uh, the speed of business, you have that that goodwill to carry you over. And that kind of goes into point number five, which is building those in strong interpersonal relationships. We've um we've seen that consistently when, you know, when when things are are, 
you know, go don't go the way that we planned. It really is those relationships that that carry you through those difficult times. And for us, that was a big lesson learned because in the workforce system, it can become very transactional. We are seen many times as public funders, not as thought partners, not as allies. And and I think we've um, especially through the apprenticeship work, we've been able to change that narrative and become more of that thought partner more of that ally that even though we're not the ones going before council to register these apprenticeships, we've been involved every step of the way in that process of getting this apprenticeship stood up. And they rely on us to connect them to maybe other resources in a community, if we, even if we're not the ones get, uh, providing those resources. So building those relationships is, is, is a really, really big component of ensuring the success of apprenticeship programs especially if um, you're in a workforce system and things can become transactional when it comes to funding. So we don't have um, any specific questions open right now, um, specific to Partner for Work for Kathleen and Edgar, um, but uh, like we said before, there, there'll be a good portion of time for questions uh, for either general questions um, or questions for panelists as you as you think of them want to continue to encourage you to to use the Q&A feature um, also wanted to um, offer up if um, you know during our our little kind of transition time between panelists if you want to use the raise hand feature we can also unmute you um, after each uh, uh, program presents and and you can ask your question out loud if that uh, works better for folks. So um, Q and A feature is there, but we can also um, do that as well. Thank you, Gloria. Thank you, Edgar and Kathleen. I think one question, you know, you talked about um, organizations seeing the workforce board in a more transactional way and actually, you know, seeing us more as thought partners. What was the timing like where did you realize that that shift was happening where they stopped just seeing you as a transactional partner and more of a thought partner um, in the work especially around apprenticeship but I think just in general thank you Kayla that's a great question so um it was when um when we when we connected our, our employer partner with the ATO with with Jared and that conversation uh, began right and and that at that point um, we really didn't have a prominent role. Like Jared and the ATO are doing everything they, they, they need to do to support them to put together the application. But um, by, by being in those meetings and then offline, they would come to us and ask questions about, hey, we're thinking about structuring the, the uh, RTI a certain way, or you know, can we pay for these things? And they were asking questions about related to the application, but really thinking about how does that, you know, does that make sense from a workforce board standpoint, how this will fit with, um, you know, WIOA and, you know, a sustainability plan. So really seeing that um, they were bringing us into the conversation about the program design, even though they were already working with the ATO, which we did connect them to, but they really still lean on us for that part. So I think that that's when it started clicking for us. Thank you. Um, I don't see any raised hands or any additional questions in the chat. Like like Gloria said, there are some questions there that I think are great for the general um, for our general question and answer period at the end. So we will bring up those questions at the end. Um, but if there are no other additional questions for Kathleen and Edgar, we are going to um, travel to the north central part of the state. Um, and we're going to pass it over to Terry Hinton, who is at the North Central Workforce Development Board, and Latricia Cohen, who is at Christ the King Manor, to talk about their experiences in their healthcare apprenticeship. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. And I am really excited to feature one of our employer sponsors who we tend to kind of show as a best practice model for growing apprenticeship programs. But before Latricia introduces herself, my role in the Workforce Board uh, for North Central, we cover six counties, mostly rural, is to really try to bridge business engagement around not only healthcare, but manufacturing. But specific to this conversation today, um, some of my specific roles in the healthcare um, expansion of business relationships is really in apprenticeship development, 
for both existing as well as growing new programs. And so programs like the one at Christ the King Manor helps to kind of set a very good foundation that we can emulate and talk about in other parts of our area. The other thing that's really important, and Edgar, you spoke about this so well, is relationship building. And with our Industry Partnership for Healthcare and Social Assistance, which I helped to facilitate, we are able to provide employers in our region in the healthcare industry with interns who go to the facilities. We help to reimburse some of the funding, but it really kind of creates a longer term relationship where those employer sponsors will not only attend our meetings, but provide us with solutions to help other areas grow and expand their occupation. So I think that our internship program is one way that we are leading the pathway as a seed opportunity for continued apprenticeship growth. We are also doing training in other parts of healthcare, phlebotomy, and also farm tech. Uh, all those, those are not being featured today. I just did want to point out that we are where the employers are. We speak to where they are and what their demands are at the time. It's very fluid, as uh, Kathleen spoke, spoke about. So there are lots of similarities, even though we are more rural. Um, before I kind of give you the overview of the healthcare industry in our little six-county area, I shouldn't say little because we cover lots of counties. Latricia, please introduce yourself. My name is Latricia Cowan, and I work at Christ the King Manor in Du Bois, PA. Uh, Christ the King Manor is a continuum of care, and we offer uh, independent living, home support, personal care, and skilled nursing care to the elders of Du Bois. Um, as Zach stated earlier, we, like most healthcare providers, are constantly searching for qualified staff, um, especially nursing staff. So we knew we had to do something a little bit different. So that's when we kind of delved into developing apprenticeship programs. Uh, we had already had a nurse aid um, program that was approved by the Department of Education. So we just further developed that program into an apprenticeship program. Um, our nurse aid program is uh, approved for a, a year's time, um, all of the related technical instruction is provided here at the manor, and that's for 120 hours. And once they complete this, that enables them to take their state certification. Um, when they're done with their related technical instruction, they complete the on-the-job training here at the manor. And we have staff mentors or journey workers to do this. Um, our staff mentors are typically our more seasoned nurse aides. Um, they also participate in some additional training. Um, we go over some communication, problem solving, um, conflict management, that sort of thing with them. That definitely has been uh, one of the bigger challenges of our program is to keep those mentors consistent um, and, you know, have enough to work with the number of apprentices we have. Um, so, we are doing that with a little bit of financial incentives, but also as a facility, we're pretty fortunate to have um, some long-term nurse aides that really do kind of go above and beyond in adjusting their schedules, um, their work area, that kind of thing to enable that to happen. Our nurse aid apprenticeship program, uh, we do about five to six classes a year, and each one of those classes has about four to six students in it. So we're looking at anywhere from, you know, 20 to 35 uh, nurse aid apprentices every year. Our LPN apprenticeship program, uh, we developed with the assistance of Jeff Tech, which is our local technical education school. They provide all of the related technical instruction that we need for our uh, LPN program. Uh, the manor pays for that, so there's no cost to the apprentice for that LPN training. Uh, once they complete that, they are eligible to take their state licensing e exam. And that's when they also begin their on-the-job training at Christ the King Manor. And again, we use the mentors or the journey workers um, who are our seasoned LPNs uh, that have completed that mentor training. We only have approximately uh, two to five LPN apprentices every year. So the need for those journey workers is not as challenging for LPNs as what it is for nurse aides. Um, the nurse aide apprentices basically 
kind of a day in the life of type thing. Um, they are hired on here at Christ the King Manor. Um, they go through an interview process, background checks, reference checks. Um, we also too um, just recently noticed that we've had a lot more applicants asking about our apprenticeship programs. So we know that the word is definitely getting out there. Um, so that's always a positive that we see um, in those new applicants. Um, once they complete that, we require that job shadow. Um, we really have found better retention rates since we have required the job shadows. Um, we feel like people in general don't understand what we all do at a nursing home, let alone what a nurse aide does or an LPN does. So we feel like that job shadow really has been beneficial for us. Um, if the applicants are you know, accepted into the program, they complete that 144 hours of RTI with myself. Um, and this includes the nurse aid training, but also the facility orientation and some extra safety training. Uh, once they complete that, then they start their on the job training with one of our journey workers. Um, the nurse aid state licensing exam is done here at the facility through Credentia. Um, they come in and, and test here at the facility. And once they pass that, they are also state certified. Um, once they get their state certification and they're working out on the floor with the journey workers, um, in the beginning, they work one-on-one -on -one with the journey workers. So they will basically work side by side um, for usually at least a month. Uh, once that journey worker feels like, you know, they're, they're making good progress, um, then they give them a little bit more leeway. Um, so they're just maybe, you know, kind of observing or working on the same unit. They're always available for questions and so on and so forth. Um, our mentors or journey workers are encouraged to routinely check in with the apprentices, um, even if it's not necessarily during their work shift. You know, we do have um, little luncheons and stuff that we help hold occasionally um, just to kind of see how it's going with everyone. And that also has been beneficial. Um, some lessons we learned. So the beginning steps in getting a registered apprenticeship program um, can be a little uh, paperwork intensive, I'll say. Uh, but once you get through that initial paperwork, it really, uh, the paperwork is minimal. There, there still are some with the rapids and things, but it's, it's not nearly as bad as that beginning step. Um, now, the most difficult part of our process is definitely um, recruiting and retaining apprentices. Um, we have definitely not been able to, to, to invest so much time and effort if it hadn't been for some of the financial assistance that we've received through North uh, Central Workforce Development Board. Um, that enables us to be able to continue to put lots of um, time and effort into further developing our programs. Uh, one way we're doing this is we just recently applied for a pre-apprenticeship program. Uh, we are waiting for approval through the Department of Labor Apprentice and Training Office um, for a paid feeding assistant. So uh, that program there um, is going to be more geared towards high school students um, and particularly high school students that have some interest in healthcare. care. Um, the program itself would be an eight hour program. Uh, of course, we would provide all of the RTI. The total time of the program would be 44 hours with their on the job training. Um, and really the goal is to, to recruit these students and really educate them on some careers in healthcare, specifically elder care. Um, you know, again, we saw from our earlier slides what a need that is. Um, once approved, we do want to develop a career day um, where we would have high school students come in and really um, tour and learn more about all of the career opportunities we have to offer, not just the nursing uh, careers. So some lessons that we've learned as a program, as a registered apprenticeship program, um, as Zach mentioned earlier, this stuff doesn't happen overnight. Uh, we initially started our, our program in late 2019. And honestly, probably in the last six to eight months, we're seeing where um, the apprentices are coming in and, or the applicants, I'm sorry, are actually coming in and asking about our apprenticeship programs and saying that's why they applied. Um, so it, it is making a difference there. Um, Kathleen mentioned the job shadows, which I think is great because 
we just had a meeting here and, and talked more about those job shadows and how beneficial we thought they are. Um, we're actually requiring them for all of our job positions now. But um, Kathleen mentioned about doing the job shadows, and we definitely have seen an increase in those retention numbers using that. And then just the only other thing that we really noticed um, helping with retention, we started doing referral bonuses for our current employees. Um, so if they would um, refer a new apprentice, um, we do offer some um, bonuses for that. Um, we just find that, you know, good workers bring good workers. So it's, it's good to get our, our name out there and um, encourage other good workers to apply here at the manor and work their way through our apprenticeship program. So, does, and that's a little bit about our programs here. And if there's any questions, just let me know. Thank you. Yeah, we, um, so it looks like uh, there's a specific question from Colleen. Um, Latricia, you might, you've sort of touched on this a little bit. Um, have you found that the job shadowing has increased interest in the position or has it weeded out those that thought the position would be different? I don't know if you wanted to elaborate on that part. Sure. I, I really feel like it has kind of weeded out those that thought it was a different type of job. Um, we've had, you know, they come in and do their job shadow and we call follow up with them and they're like, yeah, I don't think that's really for me. And, you know, we explain that's okay. It's not a job for everybody. Um, and of course, you know, we go through some of our other job opportunities here at the manor. Um, but it really cuts down on the number of students that we invest a whole lot of time and money to, um, that don't really then end up working as a nurse aide or as an LPN, um, so it, it really has made a difference. Great, yeah, so those are all the specific questions um, that we had in the Q&A right now. I don't see any other raise hands um, or other specific questions. Oh, actually, uh, it looks like Karen uh, Smith Burden just entered one in. Uh, question is, you stated that interested parties are coming in and asking about your apprenticeships. Have you tracked how they found out about your program? Um, sometimes it's other employees referring them and telling them about the programs um, and also through CareerLink. Um, our local CareerLink um, does, you know, have that posted at their career center um, so people can be informed about that there. Thank you. Uh, so Terry, I know that you were gonna share some information um, on the slide that's currently up. Yeah, the timing's actually perfect here. Latricia, thank you. That was, that was a very good description of your programs. I wish we had more people as tireless and invested as you are in apprenticeship development, but we will get there. I'm really excited to hear about this, the kind of the word is traveled, people are coming to Christ the King asking about apprenticeships, which speaks to this particular slide because this is our six county area in terms of the employment need, the annual wages or those employed and the demand for open positions as well as those that are replacement positions for people that are retired. This number here, 69, was based on November statistics of 2023. It's now around 64, 65. So perhaps I'd like to see that, I'd like to think that we're making a difference um, in getting the word out about internships or about apprenticeships to help young people kind of fill in some of those really important needs. 69 might not sound like a lot of, of need for some of you from the, the urban areas, but it is for us in our rural area, that's a huge number of uh, required of need. Um, you can see for nursing assistance, this only speaks to nursing and nursing support related occupations. Um, obviously the greatest need is around the CNA and Latricia spoke to that. And I think um, Kathleen, you may also have spoken to that issue. So that's really what I wanted to share in terms of just giving you the, the broad base picture around demand and employment for the North Central area. There were no other questions coming up in the chat right now that are specific. Terry, did you have anything else you wanted to share? Um, not really. I was just going to kind of say that the relationship building is really the critical piece. 
and there's no wrong door, you know, whether you start with an internship program or whether you start with a, another career pathway training program, everything plants the seeds for apprenticeship development. It takes longer. Sometimes it's frustrating. You get a couple doors, you know, shoved in your face, but then there are other doors that open. Um, Latricia probably never thought that she would be, you know, asking for a pre-apprenticeship and growing and expanding her capacity in that way. But eventually we're going to talk about possibly developing an RN. Um, we're not there yet, right, Latricia, but we will get there yes. soon. <laughs> <laughs> so. Yeah, um, so Perfect. Thank you, Latricia, and thank you, Terry, for sharing your experiences. Um, and so at this point, we're opening up to all questions and answers, and we're going to actually pass it over to Jared. Um, who's going to give us kind of like a state of uh, uh, healthcare apprenticeships um, for uh, from the apprenticeship and training office. Um, we do have a couple of questions in the Q&A box that will also open up now. Um, so Jared, we'll pass it over to you. All right, thank you. Um, yeah, my name is Jared and I, and I work for the uh, Pennsylvania Apprenticeship and Training Office. Uh, for those who don't know, the, uh, the PA Apprenticeship uh, and Training Office is responsible for overseeing the development and registration of all registered and pre uh, registered apprenticeship and pre apprenticeship related programs, agreements, policies, and ensure compliance of all uh, registered uh, programs and regulations within the Commonwealth. So uh, that's a little bit of what we do. The state of healthcare uh, apprenticeship in Pennsylvania is strong, um, uh, and, there, uh, and part of the reason is that is uh, it does get special attention, right? Uh, we want healthcare to um, be successful. It is uh, we want the, to be fully staffed, and the people who are retiring to pass on that knowledge. Some of the ways that the ATO is uh, working towards uh, making sure that the needs of healthcare and apprenticeship are met is that they've assigned a special uh, single point of contact um, to handle all uh, apprenticeship um, healthcare related apprenticeship programs. That's me. So um, if you have an apprenticeship uh, program in the healthcare field, um, anywhere in the state, you will be assigned a single point of contact myself. Uh, some of the benefits uh, we found is uh, creating that strong working relationship. Uh, Ed uh, mentioned before, you know, sometimes you, uh, you will run into a, a rough patch uh, and all you have is just um, that, uh, that um, uh, uh, business relationship to, to kind of lean on to, to push through uh, different barriers. Uh, I have been doing this for a while now. So uh, I, I heard some uh, talk about a uh, paperwork intensity. That is accurate. However, um, you know, I'm here to help navigate that paperwork. Uh, I've done I've done uh, different things recently to assist with uh, that uh, specific pushback. Um, I've created templates in uh, in in some of the occupations that I see most of LPN, CNA. Um, you saw this earlier. Those, those occupations, surge tech, um, EMT. A lot of those occupations have templates to make everybody's um, um, efforts a lot easier. I'm also creating a short-term committee in healthcare. So if anybody's interested in joining, uh, let me know. Uh, the goals of the short-term committee is to um, smooth out and overcome some of the uh, common barriers uh, f that we see uh, with apprenticeship. So, uh, you know, I work for, uh, again, I work for the Department uh, of Labor um, Apprenticeship Training Office. I wanna help you, right? So if there's an issue uh, that is out there, this is your chance to join this committee and, and let me know. And so uh, I put together a strong team of uh, subject uh, matter experts, and uh, we're working on refining templates, um, uh, zeroing in on uh, emerging needs in the healthcare field, um, addressing different barriers, uh, and really make the entire process uh, easier while still retaining uh, quality uh, apprenticeship programs. So the, the state of uh, apprenticeship programs in PA, strong, growing, um, and, and getting a lot of our attention. So uh, that's a quick, my quick little presentation. Um, and I'm willing to answer any questions now. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Jared. I guess now that we've heard from the Apprenticeship Training Office, um, and Jared, you know, really commend your work on the in the space and definitely, you know, encouraging everybody um, on this call that might be uh, interested in joining his work group or committee to talk about um, to advocate for your needs in 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 healthcare apprenticeship. Please do. Um, I guess I'll, you know, check with Kyla about what we want to do from here in terms of Q and A. I know there were some questions in the chat. Um, yeah, so we can we can open up. I was just going to comment that there is one um, specific to Jared from Charles um, on how people would go about volunteering for the for that committee. Uh, Charles, I'll put my email in the chat here. Uh, go. Uh, and then just email me. Anybody who's interested, please let me know. Um, you know, uh, we, we're willing to change uh, the things we do. We just need to hear from you. So if we get enough people um, uh, saying the same thing, uh, we can make a difference. So please join, uh, spread the word. Uh, but again, I'm, I'm here to I'm here to help and uh, to bring different um, uh, meet different needs uh, of the uh, of uh, people who want to start an apprenticeship program. Perfect. Um, also want to acknowledge Thomas's uh, comment in the Q&A, um, Jared, that uh, he's interested in joining the committee. Um, Thomas, if you want to enter that exact information in the chat as well, now that the chat is open for everybody to use, um, and then that way, Jared, you can maybe grab that from, from the chat. So I guess we can also, um, I guess, go up and address uh, the previous questions. I know that Tracy Smith, um, you had a question, and I believe it was uh, directed to Zach um, from the beginning on his presentation um, on if LTSS has been considered. Um, so I know that Zach uh, jumped off the call but wanted to maybe um, ask if any other um, speakers or panelists um, wanted to speak to that. Uh, Tracy, we can also um, have you come off of mute if you wanted to clarify your question. Um, we can do that as well. Give me one moment here. So Tracy, if you wanted to clarify that question um, for, for the rest of the group, you can go ahead and do that. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, so I was... Um... Inquiring actually is towards Jared, but I didn't know that he were was going to be um, online. So I know LTSS is big um, after the state had incorporated the CHC Community Health Trace Program um, in, in their time and wanted to, you know, thing, change things around. So because it's so big, I just wanted, you know, in any way since it's major healthcare, the state have incorporated it, um, the CHC program, just in any way. Um, I don't know what specific um, department or anything like that. It's just something that I thought, thought about since it's, it's so major. Yeah, I think that was um, for me. Um, you know, I asked that you send it in an email because I don't have an answer for you right now, but I want to get you one. Uh, so, um, Please, please send me an email and I'll get you an answer because I, I want to I wanna respect uh, my re your uh, response to you and I don't want to give you wrong answer, information right now. Okay, Thanks. great. Perfect, thank you. Uh, so the other question we had was from Farida. Where is there any apprenticeship programs for mental behavioral health in the area? And I know that Jennifer uh, Copeland responded to that um, regarding the pro the registered apprenticeship program you have. I don't know, um, Jennifer, if you wanted to um, speak on that some more and, and just provide some more information on that. Um, you have the ability to come off mute if you would like, um, or if, if anyone else has any information about other programs um, in that sector, you can go ahead and, and enter in the chat. Um, just wanted to kind of leave this one open to everybody. Sure, I'm happy to speak about it. Um, I apologize, I'm in a uh, setting right now that's not exactly quiet. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, great. 
Uh, yes, we at the Bucks uh, County Intermediate Unit um, in the Doylestown area, uh, we have created um, a registered apprenticeship program several years ago uh, for what is um, called a registered behavior technician certificate. It is um, meant to, in our program, we uh, have people enter into that training program while they work as a paraeducator in a special education classroom. And specifically with students who have challenging behavior. And here they complete um, 40 hours of um, technical instruction with us. They also take two um, college courses with our um, Dutch County Community College um, in the areas of special education and developmental psychology. At the end of the team, well, along their journey, um, after they, they pass a national exam, um, they do get a nationally recognized certificate, which is entitled a Registered Behavior Technician, which tends to be a pretty nice resume builder these days if you're working in that capacity. Um, for the good of the group, I also just added it to the Q&A, but it could be easily missed. The Pennsylvania Apprenticeship and Training Office is also a valuable resource for anyone across the state of Pennsylvania. If you're curious to learn about any registered apprenticeship programs in our state or nationally uh, for a specific occupation, you can go ahead and reach out to the ATO apprenticeship at pa.gov. Um, and I'll go ahead and put that in the chat as well. Um, they can search the RAPIDS database um, to see what's available in the state and uh, nationally as well. Perfect. Thank you, everyone. This is, I'm not stopping Q&A right now. If there's any additional questions, um, things that you want to share in the chat, Phil's please feel free to do so. Um, I'm about to launch a post webinar survey. Um, and if everyone can complete the survey, if there's any additional questions while you all um, are completing the survey, again, please feel free to drop those in the chat. Um, but if there are no other questions, um, once you complete the survey, you all are free to um, go. We thank you for joining our webinar. Um, we will continue to have these sessions. Um, so look out for, you know, invitations to the next session. Um, thank you again to Tara and the Keystone Development Partnership, the Keystone Apprenticeship Alliance, all of our presenters here um, for being a part. Um, we're just really grateful to be able to share these experiences with you all and hope, hoping that this is a really great um, learning space for everyone who's attended. So thank you. If there are any additional questions or comments, please place them in the chat. Tara, if you, do you have anything that you would like to share? Just thank you so much to everybody. We're so again, just so proud to partner with APHL and to present these um, to all the panelists and everybody that came today. I hope that it was helpful um, and, and illuminating and we look forward to connecting with you soon. If you're interested in the Registered Apprenticeship and Navigator Program, like I said on the slide, or if you want to join the Apprenticeship Alliance, we also do, you know, sector-based work for healthcare. Um, you can reach out to me, and we can uh, send you an orientation to, um, to the Apprenticeship Alliance, uh, and really just look forward to connecting. Thank you again for joining.